we're excited to have with us today, Ron Gunnan. Ron is the CEO and founder of Closed Loop Partners. Uh, we're going to be having a conversation around sustainability to learn a little bit more about the topic, learn a little bit more about people who are in the field of sustainability. Ron, thank you very much for taking time out of your schedule to talk to us today. Glad to be here. Okay, we'll start with our toughest question. Uh, Ron, what does sustainability mean to you? Uh, we think about it, it can be large and overwhelming, but if you specifically kind of focus on the idea of business sustainability, how do you define it and what do you think it means? Sustainability to me is the intersection between two words, efficiency and responsibility. If you're optimizing how your supply chains and manufacturing systems work and are being as efficient as possible, you're eliminating waste out of your system and thereby significantly reducing costs and protecting our environment at the same time. And that is efficiency personified. And then the other word I used, responsibility, is I'm a big believer in uh, personal responsibility and corporate responsibility. Uh, and it's important that whatever waste we generate as individuals or as uh, corporations, that we be responsible for that waste. We shouldn't have an expectation that uh, another citizen or uh, another organization be responsible for the financial cost of the waste that we're generating. Uh, and so that's why I would use the intersection of those two words, efficiency and responsibility to describe sustainability. Perfect. If you don't mind, I'll just kind of follow up on the, this a little bit. You're talking about uh, responsibility. And well, you know, sometimes as consumers, we kind of miss, miss this, miss something. Uh, you know, I buy a product, I use it, uh, and I put it in the recycling bin or I toss it up out and a lot of it doesn't get recycled or ends up in landfill. But uh, how, how do I know kind of that my responsibility, where does my responsibility end? And the flip side for a company, right? As a company, where would they draw the responsibility boundaries in your mind? Sure. Well, one thing that I write about in my book is that, unfortunately, we are operating in a system in the United States today that was designed for the financial benefit of the extractive industries, oil and gas, mining, timber, and the landfill industry. It's a system that perpetuates uh, a culture of using natural resources to manufacture more and more products that people buy and then that's dispose of in, in landfill. And we've received marketing messages that that is equated with status, the more you have, and that you could just get rid of it at, at no cost. It just, you put it in the garbage and it disappears. Uh, and if you want to recycle it, hey, you should feel good about yourself, but it's you're doing it because of a political persuasion. And that's that's a scam. That's a hoax. Uh, in reality, if we don't recycle, our tax dollars are used to send that material to very expensive landfills. And that's something that I think is really important for Americans to understand about the products that we buy and, and use and, and what we do with them when we're done with them. Uh, Ron, so the, I think this is a perfect segue to understand a little bit more about Closed Loop Partners or, as a company and what you folks do. Can you tell us a little bit more, please? So Closed Loop Partners is a investment firm and innovation center focused on building the circular economy. And what we mean by the circular economy is developing an economy in which we're able to manufacture products without a reliance on natural resource extraction, so oil for plastic, uh, mining for metal, and have to rely on costly landfills for dis the disposal of those products after they've only been used once. Uh, in a circular economy, you're able to use material science to develop sustainable materials that don't necessarily require natural resource extraction, or you're relying on advanced recycling systems to continually reuse plastics and metals uh, and uh, paper. And through that model of continually recycling and reusing that material, you're also avoiding uh, disposal in landfills. And so if you can operate within a circular economy, you're going to significantly recruit, reduce your costs and your volatility because you're no longer relying on natural resource extraction or, or landfill disposal. 
Do you, do you mind telling us a little bit more about uh, what you specifically do at uh, sure. Closed Loop Partners? And so within our uh, investment firm, we have uh, four asset classes. We have an early stage venture fund that looks for uh, the most innovative, cutting edge technologies and entrepreneurs. We uh, have a project finance fund where we lend money for the development of large scale uh, circular economy infrastructure like recycling facilities or manufacturing facilities. We have a growth equity fund that helps companies uh, along their growth trajectory. And then we have a private equity fund that acquires uh, companies. Uh, so within that portfolio, we have about 50 portfolio companies today, ranging from very early stage companies that we may have invested a couple hundred thousand dollars into to companies that we've acquired for tens of millions of dollars from our PE fund. And then we have an innovation center called the Center for the Circular Economy that works on some of the most challenging bottlenecks where there may not be a investment grade uh, solution yet. Okay. Uh, I mean, what you described sounds wonderful. Do you mind telling us a little bit about your career journey and how you ended up founding this company? I mean, at the core, really, I want to, if you could answer, I mean, how do you get others to understand the value of waste or understand kind of what you talked about, this idea of leaving responsibility aside, but just focusing on this idea of efficiency, that there's yeah. value in this waste it, it, to kind of to bring the story to life? Yeah. So it, uh, it, it go, actually goes all the way back to when I was in high school in the late 80s and early 90s. And needed to get a, a job. Uh, I grew up in a, in a single parent household. And just through uh, good fortune, I ended up working for a family where I was babysitting for them and fixing stuff around the house and doing whatever they needed to just make some extra money. Uh, the, the, the dad was one of the first green architects in America. And so in, in high school, I started hearing him talk about uh, solar and wind and passive solar and, and sustainable materials. And I had not been um, influenced yet by the way uh, things were currently being designed and, and manufactured. Uh, he was my first exposure to really thinking about uh, design and, and manufacturing and everything he talked about made total sense. Like, the sun is free, wind is free, like why would you not utilize it? Or if you can design buildings to be more energy efficient, why, why wouldn't you do that? It just intuitively made sense to me. And it's an area that I became very interested in. Out of college in the late nineties, I started my career at uh, Anderson Consulting, which is now Accenture. And although there wasn't necessarily sustainability focus, it was a very important foundation for everything else I did in sustainability going forward because it gave me a foundation in business management, process, and technology. But in my late 20s, I realized my real passion was at this intersection of maximizing uh, returns and impact and went back to business school at, at Columbia Business School and co-founded my first company, a company called Recycle Bank. And I was a CEO there from 2003 to 2010. And then I exited that company. And then I started a small solar company and also started uh, teaching a uh, course at Columbia Business School uh, based on entrepreneurship with a social mission. Uh, and then in 2012, uh, I got recruited to join Mayor Bloomberg's administration as his uh, deputy commissioner of sanitation, recycling and sustainability. It's a role they developed for me to come in and really reimagine and rebuild New York City Sanitation Department with a focus on recycling and uh, circular economy. And uh, one of the interesting things about being a political appointee uh, is the day you join, you know what your last day is going to be. Uh, it's when the mayor or governor is out of office. And uh, so with about a year left in the administration, I just started thinking about what would I like to do with the rest of my career and develop the concept around closed loop partners. Wonderful. If you don't mind, I'll kind of ask a little bit more about uh, your public uh, appointment. Uh, you talked about, if we go back, uh, this idea of responsibility and a lot of kind of what we put in the recycling or waste ends up in municipal landfills or municipal kind of resources. So how do we get uh, 
people that are contributing more to share more of the burden, right? Re- really, it's for everybody pays about the same, regardless of what waste you put, yeah. put into the system. So how do we spread that to customers or, or, or companies? It's a, it's, it's a great question. Uh, one of the massive inefficiencies in the U.S. system is that whereas electricity is priced as a utility, the amount of electricity you use, you pay for, electricity that I use, I pay for. Water is priced as a utility. The amount of water you use, you pay for. The amount of water I use, I pay for. Waste, and this was intentional because it was to the benefit of the extractive industries and the landfill industries who lobbied government for waste to be structured in, in such a way. It's not priced as a utility. It's a priced as a cost of the commons, meaning if you do an amazing job recycling and send very little to landfill, but I can't be bothered. I just throw everything in the garbage. You don't have a, a significant cost in terms of the material you sent to landfill. You recycled everything. But me, I, I was too lazy to recycle. I just decided to throw everything in the garbage. The government's going to expect you to share in the cost of uh, my waste disposal. And they're going to hide that cost in your tax bill so that you're none the wiser and know to either complain about it to the government and switch the system, or you come to me as your neighbor and say, you better recycle more because I'm done subsidizing your lifestyle. And that's unfortunately effectively a scam that's been um, perpetrated and perpetuated uh, on, on US society. And so the way to develop a more efficient and equitable system is to price waste as a utility where you can throw whatever you want in the garbage and not recycle. You just have to be responsible for the cost of disposing of an Atlanta. I mean, what do you think it'll, so I, I mean, they have similar uh, infrastructure systems in place, like in Ireland, right? You pay per pound of how much waste you, you, you yeah. send to landfill. Do you th- what do you think it'll take for something like that to the U.S. to come in? Well, you're, you're starting to slowly see that, which is called pay as you throw, uh, adopted in communities in the United States. So that's the good news is slowly but surely you're seeing the adoption of that. Um, I think it requires a few things. I think it requires uh, more awareness amongst the citizenry uh, of the, the, the tax system and, and how it's structured. I think it requires some courageous politicians. Um, and I think it requires some, some very forward looking corporate CEOs who say, look, there's this expectation that my company use more recycled material or that I close the loop and get the material back into my supply chain, which I'm happy to do. But it's almost impossible for me to achieve that if I'm selling into a market in which the consumers are actually incentivized <laughs> to throw it in, in the garbage or, or aren't made aware of the cost of throwing it in the garbage. Hey, government, uh, if you want me to achieve a circular economy or use X amount of recycled content or buy recycled material out of your recycling programs, you need to structure uh, waste disposal in a way that motivates people to recycle. So really kind of spreading more information, educating the, the, the customer and just really laying bare this information. I really like the example you gave about my my uh, disposal bill and some my neighbor's disposal bill. If we just kind of make that clear, make people understand, because I, I find a lot of people don't understand that. Would you? I've, uh, I, I've had the experience of being able to convince uh, Fox News watching uh, people who think they're Sean Hannity's you know, number one fan uh, to recycle by explaining to them that uh, we can debate climate change or progressive values or the environment. One thing we can't debate is you don't recycle, you're basically expecting me to subsidize your lifestyle. You're like, uh, you know, a leech on 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 the system. And uh, when you make them aware of that, uh, they actually change their behavior, and um, and 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 recycle more. And so I think a lot of it does come down to 
first exposing this this scam of how our system has been structured and making people more aware of how their tax dollars are used. I think that's the first step. And then hopefully that leads to better policy structure. Well, I think there's a perfect segue for us to, to really push on this idea of companies. Uh, I mean, as closed loop partners, you see the value of waste. You understand kind of in closing the loop. Uh, you mentioned kind of how you can describe it to individuals. You know, when I worked with companies, whether it's we're looking at waste, going to zero waste landfill, or just reducing energy consumption, it's like you said, you're like, how do you not see this? You know, using less electricity means lower expenses, higher profitability for the firm. Of course, you want to be doing this. But how come other companies don't see uh, sustainability, or they don't understand kind of the value in closing the loop, yeah. closing that circular value chain. Well, the, the the good news is that a lot of companies are starting to realize that. So that's the good news. The the reason why more are not realizing it or not realizing it fast enough is uh, a fewfold. Uh, first is. For public companies, unfortunately, they're stuck in this quarterly earnings rat race where it's very difficult for them to make long-term commitments and long-term investments whose benefit is going to show up two years from now, three years from now, five years from now, because the market wants to see that benefit um, in the next quarter. And that type of short-termism hurts the company long-term and hurts shareholders long-term, hurts society long-term. But that's one of the issues. The other issue is, unfortunately, a lot of uh, CEOs today who are uh, in their late 50s, 60s, grew up in a culture and, and were taught this in business school that you don't worry about anything other than the bottom line. That's it. You just focus on the bottom line, all this other externality, other stake hurdles. If you can help them out, great, but don't let them become a distraction. And that's, that's effectively what they were taught in business school. And, and that's how they... They, they grew up and evolved. And it requires a, a, a fundamental shift in thinking, which you're seeing from a number of leaders today in the corporate world, which is great to see, but also in a younger uh, generation of executives that's coming up. A, a good example of that cognitive dissonance that exists today is uh, Paul Pullman, who is the CEO of Unilever from 2010 to 2019, was an amazing example of foresight, vision, leadership when it came to sustainability. He produced over the 10 years that he was CEO returns of 290%. Other companies that kept their, their antiquated business models in place didn't perform nearly as well or lost value for shareholders. But still today, if a CEO of a major company went on an earnings call and talked about sustainability and what they were trying to do and so on and so forth, the reaction would be, well, hold on, is this gonna be a discount? Is this some concession? So on and so forth. The, the market hasn't trained itself yet to actually look at the data, even though that's what they say they do. They still rely a lot on you know, antiquated myths of how business is supposed to run, which oftentimes is devoid from actual data in terms of what consumers want or employees want or uh, expectations of regulators. Kind of going back to this, the lack of them understanding the new business model or the new the new way the business model is supposed to run. Yeah. yeah. I, you mentioned it, Ron, and I, I know you had a book uh, that was just released. First, congratulations. It's a great read for those of you uh, that are listening. But you talk about kind of uh, the closed loop supply chain. You talk about the values and opportunities that are, that are missed by companies that don't understand why they should close the loop. Uh, do you mind giving us one or two of these examples uh, as opportunities for companies that they kind of, really recognize this value by closing the loop. Yeah, so let's take the uh, the apparel, fashion and apparel industry. And th this is actually true for any industry, but um, today when you walk into a store and you buy something, the brand doesn't know anything about you. You could be buying laundry detergent, you could be buying a jacket. They don't know your name. Uh, they don't know where you live. They really don't know much about you. Most importantly, they don't know what your experience was like with the product. They don't know how long it took you to use the product. They don't know why you stopped using the product. They don't know when you went to buy a new product. Everything is one-off transactional. And the most expensive thing in business is to acquire a customer. 
And so we spend a lot of money in business, acquiring a customer, selling them something, losing touch with them. And then you have to start that process all, all over again. What I like to talk about with business executives is the circular economy from a material standpoint can actually be overlaid on top of a uh, circular consumer experience. Meaning if we can build models where a consumer says, I'm finished using your product and the company says, well, great, I'll come get it from you. You're getting that material back, but you're also maintaining that customer in a closed loop where you can say to them, well, how did you enjoy the product? Is there anything that could have been better about it? And you use that information for other consumers. And then you say, well, thank you for letting me know about your experience with the product and for sending it back to us. Um, here's your next uh, product. And I think every industry has an opportunity to begin to recognize that and build that circular commodities loop that will then also become a circular consumer loop for them. So I'd like to kind of follow up on and ask, uh, again, hopefully, ideally something from uh, your book, you know, why, why do you think companies are stuck today in this take, take, make, waste loop? I mean, what is there a trigger that we need to start seeing for them? Because what you described is wonderful, right? Of course, everybody wants to know about their customer, how they use the product, right? If we get that back, we understand how they used it, what worked, what didn't, what extra components we have in our product we can take out. And that's value add for the companies. I mean, what trigger do they need to kind of... Yeah, and, and unfortunately, you oftentimes need some type of crisis to be the trigger. Uh, and people will look back and say, I, I can't believe we used to operate that way. What were we thinking? Um, but the, the real question is, why did you wait for a crisis to, to change? And I'll give you an example of one recent crisis. The way uh, protective equipment in the medical industry used to uh, be structured is, I'm a hospital. Uh, every month or every quarter, I buy the same amount of protective equipment. Uh, it gets used once and then we throw it away and then we get our next shipment. And that worked fine for decades. You pay for the uh, purchase, you use it once, you pay for the disposal. And no one ever questioned, is this the most efficient system? And then you have a crisis like COVID. And under COVID, two things happen at the same time. You had way more demand than traditional supply and supply chains began to crack. So maybe if you just had demand far out strip, strip traditional supply, supply chains maybe in a couple of weeks could have ramped up and just met the market demand. But when you coupled that with actual supply chains were starting to break under, under COVID because people couldn't go to work, people couldn't travel, all of a sudden hospitals found themselves with a massive shortage of protective equipment. And herein we see the massive danger of the linear system that we've been living under. Yes, it's horrible for the environment that we're extracting all these natural resources for manufacturing, but it's also deadly when you have a crisis and all of a sudden hospitals can't get protective equipment, people were dying. And so some people looked around and said, well, wait a second, maybe we can figure out a way to sanitize all of this protective equipment and then just continually reuse it and reuse it while we're sanitizing it and sanitizing it. And that way we can save lives. And in that type of innovation and ingenuity, first it saves lives, but long-term what it does is it actually makes the hospital much more efficient and reduces cost because now you're not constantly buying more protective equipment and paying to dispose of it and buy more protective equipment and paying to dispose of it, you make one purchase and you just continually reuse it by, by sanitizing it. So that's a perfect example of where uh, a crisis quickly demonstrated to an industry that they had to change, but they should have changed decades ago. And because they didn't, a lot of people unfortunately lost their lives. Do you think, uh... I mean, the N95 example, sanitizing the, the PPE equipment is a perfect example of hospitals. Do you think kind of once the supply chain catches up and we're over this pandemic, hospitals are going to go back to the old bad way of doing it or they've learned the efficiency of value add uh, of, you know, sanitizing and closing the loop on their PPE? 
it, it'll be a combination. I don't think progress um, is uh, ever um, linear or on a completely upward trajectory. I think it, uh, it, it has its bumps and its valleys uh, and, and its upswings. Uh, I think uh, we have had a, a major upswing in terms of a realization about the inefficiencies of linear supply chains and how costly it can be and how deadly it can be. And that means that there's been a now a major upswing in recognition and innovation, uh, but there are still uh, people that make a lot of money off of maintaining the legacy system that aren't gonna wanna let it go. Uh, and there'll be some challenges that uh, that progress is, is confronted with. So it's not gonna be a smooth, hey, we should all just sanitize our PPE equipment and live in a better world. I think you'll see some hospitals doing it, some hospitals doing it some of the time and some hospitals still not doing it. But I think if you look over the next five to 10 years, that's where the movement is definitely headed. Let's go on to uh, hopefully a, a, a better uh, uh, story. Uh, we, if you don't mind, if we can talk about one of the specific partners you work with in closed loop partners. I know uh, I, I know Al Gramo's got a wonderful story. Do you mind telling us a little bit about uh, what they do? Sure. Al Gramo is a company uh, based in Chile, but now also uh, offering service in the US along with all over Latin America that enables people to buy their household cleaning products through a reusable container system. And so uh, the way it works is you have an El Gramo uh, machine at your supermarket or your bodega, and you have your reusable containers for your cleaning products that uh, have a chip embedded in them. And uh, when you go to the store, uh, you put your Algramo container in the machine and on your mobile phone, you can decide exactly how much detergent or soap uh, you wanna buy. You pay for it on your mobile phone and you go about your way with, uh, with your detergent and, and you're no longer paying for the packaging anymore. You're just paying for uh, the detergent and the exact amount that, that you need. And, and that really helps kind of as, as a customer who sees value in that, right? If I the old way of doing it, maybe uh, the linear uh, value chain, I toss out after using the container, right? After using the product, I toss out the container, maybe it gets recycled, maybe it doesn't, but the cost yeah. of me paying for it, I pay for that plastic, right? The company needs that. Now it's internalized as a one-time payment, I assume? It's, it's that. And there's also another efficiency, which I'm sure we've all had the experience of throwing something out, even in the recycling container, where it wasn't completely empty because we didn't need all of that. And that might be just because, hey, we're going away on vacation or we're moving or for whatever reason. And so being able to actually buy the specific amount that you need at that moment in time also means you're just producing less uh, material. Um, and it's a great way for the companies to reduce their packaging costs. And it's a great way for consumers to uh, reduce reduce cost because the cost of packaging isn't embedded in their product anymore, but also an opportunity to reduce cost because now they're provided the flexibility to buy exactly what they need, not buy whatever one or two sizes are, are available on the shelf. Perfect. So, I mean, how did Al Gramo get others to buy in? How did they get you to buy in? But uh, others kind of to see the light. I mean, I know it's recently launched in Walmart and available kind of in a few other places, but uh, how, how do you kind of get others on board this wonderful story? Sure. Well, interestingly, we were introduced to Al Gramo by Unilever. Uh, so we're always excited when a large corporate comes to us and says, here's this major innovation. We're excited to use it. They just need to be capitalized. Are you interested in investing? Because that's great validation for us. So that's how we were originally introduced to Al Gramo. So we went into it knowing that uh, they were going to have corporate partners and major brands interested in them. And, uh, and since we invested, the conversations with major brands have gone very well. It solves a number of issues for major brands. It gets them out of this plastic crisis of producing huge amounts of, of plastic. And, and, and the issue is very severe in emerging markets where there isn't plastics recycling infrastructure. So that's one solution it provides for uh, major brands. Uh, it reduces their costs because they can now sell product without the packaging, number two. 
Number three, it gets back to something we discussed earlier, which is they now have a direct relationship with the customer that's buying their product because you're paying for it on your on your phone uh, as opposed to just using your your credit card or or, or cash at the store and they they know uh, nothing about you. So it's a it's a obvious uh, opportunity for the brands to meet their environmental goals and and reduce costs. And so the conversations between El Gramo and the brands have gone very well. Is this something you, you think we'll start seeing other companies doing? I mean, does it work in some industries versus others? Uh, I think that's, I think reuse is a, de- is a definite trend. One of the things that we've been working with Starbucks on is an uh, introduction of um, reusable cups in their stores. So I, I think over the next couple of years, uh, more and more consumers are going to see um, a lot more. Um, reuse systems introduced. Perfect. Uh, it, we don't have commercials, so this is a perfect kind of a sp- uh, time for a break. Uh, let's take a kind of few minute break and kind of let, ask you some personal questions, get to know you on, on the personal side. Uh, if you think about your phone, what is one app you have on your phone that you cannot absolutely live without? YouTube. Okay. I, I would not have guessed that. All right. And what is the best dessert you've ever had or and where and or where, or if it's bite off the store, what kind of? I love a good dessert. So I need a moment. Yeah. I would say a good tiramisu. A- any specific place or uh, j- just homemade? Well, Celeste. One of my favorite restaurants in New York, I think, has a excellent tiramisu. Okay. And but I love desserts. So if you, anybody you know, has something to suggest that I should try with an inclination towards chocolate, you know, I'm all for it. That's wonderful. Uh, I, I'll give you kind of a, a few uh, offline, some specific. Uh, I, I'm an ice cream fan myself. So some specific uh, chocolate based ice creams. Um, last thing, uh, what's one interesting thing that uh, people don't? know about you, people that you work with or people that, you know? Hmm. Uh, I grew up playing water polo. That was my passion through college. Wow. Okay. Uh, thanks for sharing. Uh, it's always nice to see that our guests uh, are nice people and have something uh, in addition to being great at their job. Uh, Ron, we're going to kind of go back and talk about uh, sustainability. Uh, really, how do you go about measuring it? So if we think about a company, uh, you mentioned a few companies, but if we look at kind of their performance on sustainability, I really like how you talked about uh, the market does an inefficient job of measuring sustainability. I know we have a lot of ESG metrics and uh, I, I know I've worked with them closely, a, a lot of them, and it's a lot of a lot of times binary number, right? They're doing this versus that, but sustainability is uh, much more complex. So if we look at a company, how do we know if they're doing a good job on sustainability or, or a poor job? That's a great that's a great question uh, because oftentimes it's it's not clear. Uh, and I think one of the, uh, you can definitely find it out if you put the time into it. And I think disclosure and transparency is probably the best place to start is, do you feel like this company is um, proactively sharing information about their product with you? Uh, and that should be a first step to feeling trust between you and, and that product. But that's an area where I think there's a lot of opportunity to develop much better uh, rating systems for consumers to be able to make decisions. So any of your listeners interested in that space, uh, that's definitely a, a growing and uh, good good place to be. Uh, so, uh, I guess following up on that, I mean, is there... Uh... You, I, I agree with you. I mean, this lack of current infrastructure availability of information that's easily digestible. Is there uh, specific things that they can do to see how a company is doing on sustainability or some element or some measure in sustainability of what exists out there already? Well, I think looking at the packaging, identifying, are they using recycled content in their packaging? That's one important step. I think looking at the ingredients on the package and uh, and seeing if they're being transparent and communicative about the health uh, aspects of those of those materials. I think is 
uh, another great way to, to do it. I think um, they're talking about their supply chain publicly in terms of who's making the products that you're using or growing the food that, that you're eating is another good way to, to do it. And all of these companies now have sustainability reports generally uh, that are published. Um, so those are a couple of, uh, of, of ways to do it. Um, you know, I, I think if you use an example of like a seventh generation or a method cleaning product, uh, that's a good example of, um, of companies that have done a really good job of communicating with their, with their customers. Perfect. I mean, so you, do you, beyond information sharing, do you think there are specific elements that uh, companies can do or, or start as they embark on their sustainability journey? I mean, what should be the, f the first step? Transparency. First step should be, I, I think company CEOs sometimes are reticent to disclose what their challenges are because they think they'll get some backlash. But you know, like, like your family and like your friends, I think what people appreciate most is honesty. They'll stick with you if you're honest. They won't stick with you if you're hiding things from them, even, even if their intention was in their mind a good one because they didn't think you could handle the information or wouldn't understand the information. What I think human beings seek out in a relationship is as much honesty as possible and as much transparency as possible. And I think if CEOs start with, hey, this is what we're doing well, this is what we're struggling with. This is what we're doing to fix what we're struggling with. We'd love your ideas and suggestions. Consumers, I think for the most part, won't look at those struggles as, oh, that's what they're like. I'm not participating with this brand anymore. I think most consumers will go, oh, they're being honest. They're being transparent. I can trust this brand and therefore I'll continue to, to participate. I, I like that. I mean, I, I, one of the things that we kind of really push is, is trying to help people understand. I like how you said information on the packaging, right? So most people, uh, they look at the recycling symbol on the back. They think, oh, it's got recycling no matter what, I'll toss it. And, you know, in, in America today, we rarely recycle anything that's type that's not type one or type two plastics, right? Most right. of that does end up in the landfill. And this idea of technically recyclable and economically recyclable really kind of... Uh, yeah, well, that, that gets back... That gets back to the earlier part of our conversation where the, the government needs to better regulate and be more transparent in terms of what does it mean for something to be recyclable. And I think a number of industries have been able to push this concept that, well, if it's technically recyclable, meaning it could be turned into something, then let's go tell the consumer that we've checked the environmental box, we're fine. But in reality, that's that's has no association with whether or not it's actually going to be sorted and turned into a new product and material. What's the biggest driver of that is, does that commodity have value in the recycling system? So it costs us in the recycling industry $70 a ton to process material, paper, metal, glass, and plastic that comes in. So if a commodity is worth more than $70 a ton, it's going to get sorted and turned into a new product. If it's worth less than $70 a ton, even if it's put in your recycling bin, it's probably uh, going to end up going to landfill because there's no uh, profitable market for it. So on to kind of our last set of questions. Uh, this is really a two-part question. Uh, if we're thinking about people who are trying to get into the field of sustainability, uh, maybe somebody just starting in their careers or early on, uh, what advice do you have for them to either transition to the field of sustainability within their company or, or get company kind of on board with this journey? try to think about it through the lens of what I started the podcast with of efficiency and responsibility. I think we have a tendency to just anchor ourselves on doing this is good for the world, which it is. And that's an important criteria, but in terms of behavior change and adoption, we also oftentimes have to communicate it in a way that the listener views it as in their self-interest and that's oftentimes done through the lens of doing this is going to make your life more efficient or um, give you the pride of feeling a sense of responsibility 
uh, for for your actions and, and behaviors. I think that's great advice. I mean, uh, so I, my I think you partially answered it, but my second follow up question with that is that advice differ a little bit for somebody maybe who's a little bit more senior in their career, midway through their career, uh, rather than somebody starting off early. My general answer is no, actually. Okay. I think it's the same, actually. The, 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 someone junior, someone senior, they're dealing with different aspirations, different pressures, obviously. But I think from a starting point, coming at it from, this is something I feel strongly about. I need to convince people that this is what I should be doing or my company should be doing, trying to view it through the lens of, is this making things more efficient? Uh, is this providing people to take more responsibility for something that they should be responsible for uh, is, is an important place to start. Thank you very much. I think that's great advice and that'll help uh, kind of this low hanging fruits. Uh, we like, I, I like to call it the easy wins, right? Telling people that, okay, turn off the lights. Let's get value from the, the waste that we kind of, yeah. well, what we sent to landfill, there's value. Let's try and extract that. Uh, we've, we've been talking a lot about corporate social responsibility and what companies can do and kind of how politics plays into that a little bit. But a lot of it at the end of the day comes back to the individual, the person. And so I, you know, I like to call it, I think about it as personal social responsibility. Uh, are there kind of some things that come to your mind that we as individuals or me as a, a, a or a listener or somebody who's watching kind of th say, okay, as a person, I can change ABC or I can do XYZ a little bit differently to have a better impact on sustainability? I, I'm going to give you a, an answer that uh, most people probably wouldn't give, mostly because there's a number of answers to this question. So I want to try to add something to the conversation that's a little bit different and, and, and additive. Have higher expectations of your elected officials. The uh, political discourse in the US is, is too much around, if it's good for the environment, it's bad for jobs. That's a scam. That's a scam by legacy industries that uh, pay politicians to say things that will ensure that they get to maintain their legacy antiquated industries that you know, require public subsidies and, and the ability to harm the environment. The, the reality is um, building sustainable infrastructure and sustainable business models, it's going to create a lot of jobs. It's going to reduce a lot of costs in the system. And holding our elected officials uh, responsible for, I, I don't, don't, don't talk to me about GDP right now. Talk to me about, is the air cleaner? Is the water cleaner? Do I have access to green spaces? Are my streets clean? Uh, am I paying a huge landfill bill embedded in my taxes that I was not aware of? You know, ask those types of questions of your elected officials. And, um, and, and that's where a lot of, I think, uh, change can come from. And it'll make it easier for people to take personal responsibility because the systems will be more aligned with the behaviors that they want to pursue. Thank you. I, I really think that's wonderful advice. And it helps close the loop as we kind of go back to our beginning part of our conversation is these extractive industries maybe are getting subsidized in other ways that we don't know. And so kind of when we bring that to the forefront, once we remove that subsidies, you really can start to see the business case for maybe some of these industries or some of these uh, investments not make sense from a financial perspective. And hopefully the markets will respond to that. I will really want to thank you for your time. I appreciate, uh, you know, all the, uh, you kind of struggling with all, uh, pushing through with all our pushy questions and uh, thank you very much. At the end, is there anything else, kind of any parting thoughts you want to leave us with? Always looking for leading innovation in the area of supply chains and manufacturing and uh, always uh, reach out if you have any ideas. And also if you're interested in the space, visit our website at closewithpartners.com and take a look at our uh, portfolio companies. There may be uh, some companies in there that are interested to your listeners in terms of their uh, personal behaviors and interests and, and households.
Wonderful. Thank you very much for your time, Ron. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Stop. Stop.